Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Live at Five tour. I am the curator, Kevin Adkison, coming to you live with a very special tour of the home of Iris Eichenberg, who is the head of Cranbrook Academy of Arts uh, metalsmithing department. Now, I am the curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research, and I am delighted to be with you all today. We have toured a lot of places since these tours began in March, but I think today is going to be one of the most exciting and certainly one of the most exclusive. Um, Iris, who has been of the smithing department at Cranbrook Academy of Art generously has allowed us into her really beautiful home and so we'll be touring through both Eliel Saarinen's 1938 architecture for the artist in residence but also Iris's own works of art that she has at home and the really incredible collection of art that she has that she lives with. Uh, George Booth liked to say that a life without beauty was only half lived, and I can assure you that uh, Iris is living her full life because this is going to be a really beautiful tour. Now, I don't want to step too far outside of Wi-Fi, so I'm going to stand here on the front porch and just show us where we are on Academy Way. So here we see the home of Carl Millis, which we toured back in June. And then next to that is Saarinen House, which is reopened for tours and there's a virtual tour. And then the student dormitories and the arts and crafts studios. And then here is residence number three is its formal name. And this series of residences were built, there are four in a row. And they were built in 1938 by Eliel Saarinen as architect of the Cranbrook Architectural Office. And these were built to house the faculty of Cranbrook Academy of Art. They are wood frame buildings with brick veneer, which is different from most of Cranbrook's buildings, which are solid masonry, either solid brick or solid stone. And then they have these um, seamed copper roofs at the top. And a number of different people have lived here over the years. So at residence number three, uh, it was the home of Wally Mitchell and his family from 1953 until he was made president in 1970 and then he got to move into Saarinen House. It was then the home of George Ortman and Richard DeVore and then it was the home of Daniel Liebskind when he was head of our architecture department. Most recently, it was the home of Heather McGill, who lived here from 1991 until she left Cranbrook in 2019. Uh, now, I was investigating with my colleague Laura McNewman as to who the M is for on the gate. Um, I thought it might be Wally Mitchell, but he didn't really get here in time to have his uh, name on the gate. So I'll figure out who the rest, the original resident was one of these days. Now, as we go in, it is just like Sarnen House and Millis House, an attached home. So we have one here and then the other home, which is going to be a mirror image, is just on the other side. Now, we head in and we see some great Sarnen details like this little uh, box here with the bricks turned. Of course, the built in doorbell and then there is also originally a built in porch light that's shown straight down on the door. We go in through the original door handle and we want to keep the cats inside. And welcome in to a artist in residence home at Cranbrook. So we're going to tour through the whole house today. It is a four bedroom, four bath home. It was originally a four bedroom, five bath home with maid's quarters, but the maid's quarters are now our guest house. And before we get started with our walk around, um, if you are just, if you're new, newer to Cranbrook and you don't know the structure of the Academy of Art, the students here are graduate students. They are studying in 11 different disciplines divided between craft, design, and fine art. Uh, the craft departments of metalsmithing, uh, weaving, or fiber, and ceramics. 
And the artist in residence, they don't teach, they don't lecture. Instead, they are critics and they are mentors and they work alongside their students. So Iris's metalsmithing studio is in the metalsmithing department and she teaches by uh, offering up critiques and mentorships to her students. Um, she is interested in students sort of t spending their two years at Cranbrook, earning their Masters of Fine Arts in a process of researching and by learning, by doing and experimenting uh, and learning through a sort of rigorous series of experimentation across materials um, and, and sort of across different techniques. Iris Eichenberg herself is a German-born metalsmith. She studied at the Gerrit Reitfeld uh, Academy in Amsterdam. She graduated from the jewelry department in 1994. She uh, then worked as an artist and curator when she was appointed or she began teaching at the Reitfeld Academy in 1996. She became head of its jewelry department in 2000, a position she held until she came to Cranbrook in 2007. So each department just has one artist and so Iris is head of all of the metalsmithing department. And one thing about her own work, she is, she's really interested in evoking sensual reactions uh, that sort of puzzle the viewer, and she's less interested in using sort of words and descriptions to make sense of her work than evoking feelings and invo invoking, um, give little hints and sort of open doors and to trigger the sense perception in people. And she trusts the viewer to establish more meaning to a work of art than what she uh, was thinking when she made the art. And she doesn't want her work to shut the door on the viewer, but instead to open up new possibilities. So thank you so much to Iris for opening up the door of her home today. And I hope that uh, we will see lots of beautiful things, spark lots of interesting conversations and ideas, and I am not a contemporary art curator, so this is a lot of this stuff is really new and interesting to me, and I hope we enjoy the journey. So right off the bat, walking into the house, we notice the sort of height of the, the home. So it has really high first floor ceiling heights. Uh, we also notice down here the beautiful man, uh, Mr. Mormai, uh, which is Dutch for beautiful man, so one of two two cats in the house. And right off the bat, uh, we see some art that Iris picked up in her travel. She bought these in Senegal. Um, these are African pregnancy masks. Uh, and so these are made by the Makonde people in Tanzania and Mozambique. Uh, and these, it's a matrilineal society. And so women would, or they still sculpt these pieces out of kapuk wood, and they are symbols of fertility for both the women of the village and for the fields. And so we're going to see a lot of art that Iris uh, has collected in her travels through Europe, Africa, South America, Oceania, Asia. And I think we'll get started here in what Saarinen labeled the office, what Iris is using as a home studio, and we see her beautiful geraniums here, uh, which if you drive along Academy Way, you know these are out during the summer. She's been keeping the big ones alive for some six years. And in this room, we see her books, uh, as well as these really wonderful Moderna, uh, Bandernica fiberglass Eames chairs which I was not familiar with the super low versions, um, but of course the Eameses met at Cranbrook, Charles taught at Cranbrook. These are 21st century editions of really icons of Cranbrook's design. There's also this really wonderful Moroccan Berber rug, which I would love to have the uh, textiles of Iris's home. And then sort of the largest piece in this room is one of Iris's own works of art. This is a model that she made for the 2017 exhibition at Simone de Souza Gallery in Detroit called Kein Ort Nirgens, or No Place Nowhere. And it's a sort of very architectural model that we can project ourselves into occupying. Now, next to this model is a 
metal um, sort of piece of armor by a Finnish art artist, Aija Mustanen, who is part of the hibernate group of women Finnish artists. And Mustanen uh, works in metal and she's interested in taking sort of sheet metal and forming it into functional objects associated with her Finnish culture. So she makes lots of mittens, uh, aprons and other sort of protective pieces that she sculpts by hammering the metal. And so it is this very much adapting the everyday into this sort of art artistic realm. And she formed the hibernate group of artists in 1999. Next on the wall is a piece by the Detroit artist Nancy Mitch, uh, Michnik, who is part of the cast corridor of artists. She uh, came, of, uh, came about in the 1980s with exhibits at um, MOCAD and at the DIA. She worked in New York. She's back working in Detroit. And so this is one of Helen Michnik's paintings. Then there is the desk chair here, which is by uh, Egon Eiermann. And if you don't know Mr. Eiermann, he's sometimes referred to as Germany's Charles Eames. He was a German architect working in West Germany in the latter half of his career. Uh, he did the Kaiser Wilhelm Church in the sort of center of the former West Berlin. Uh, and he also did the German embassy in Washington, D.C. And this is his SE 140R desk chair of 1957. And it's made of nut veneer and then metal pieces. And I, can think, I think you can see why we call him the German Charles Eames. And then along the wall, Iris ever the resourceful artist. She adapted this shelf, which was from an exhibit she had a few years ago, into displaying her works of art. And so we see here a work by Jason Carter, who is a graduate of Cranbrook's painting department, that he photographed in Saarinen House across the street. He was interested in documenting Saarinen House in digital light. So he used laptops and TVs to illuminate Eliel Saarinen's home. Uh, and then he sort of creates these mysterious digital interpretations of the historic interior. There's also this great painting and, and drawing piece by the Dutch artist Eric Mattison, uh, who is interested in sort of creating collages of stories with his pieces. So uh, it's not a collage, it is a painting, but it has these sort of distinct colorways and elements that begin to tell a story across the scene. There's also this heavy boulder along the bench. Um, this is a piece by Emmy Bright, who is the current co-head of the Cranbrook Pit Print Media Department. And this is a series of objects she made in 2018, uh, where she did two-dimensional screen prints of three-dimensional objects. And so it came as a flat pack rock, uh, and then you unfold it and you turn it into a sculptural rock. But she's interested in the idea of how do you get something like a print that is so unsculptural and turn it into a sculpture? And then the sort of pathetic result of this kind of paper rock sitting here quite, you know, flaccid in its um, childlike assembly. And then I'll also point out that Emmy has a new uh, book that's out, More Stupids, which is a book and deck of cards. And so check that out at your local fine booksellers. Now, as I mentioned, Aliel Sarnan did call this the library. So these are the original fur bookshelves and then plywood uh, doors down below. Next, we will head past some more African masks and into the living room area, which I am quite certain that the Facebook video is really not doing justice to how beautiful the proportions are in this room. Um, Eliel Saarinen is a real master of bringing daylight into space and of creating uh, different proportions with his design that are really quite pleasing. Uh, so the ceiling height here is really 
very high, and then you just have this great western window. Now, along this gallery wall, there are a number of pieces that I'll point out, and I promise we're not going to talk about every single object in the house, but I'm just going to share with you some of Iris's favorites that she taught me about. Um, and then if you have any questions about something, just type it in. So we'll start with one of Iris's own pieces, um, this sort of pink floof. And Iris is interested in working with colors that she's sort of not attracted to. And so she's not interested in creating just sort of beautiful, harmonious works. And a lot of her art is in these sort of flesh tones from nylons and sort of all the different ways that nylon comes in different skin tones and then adapting them into these new objects that really do make you want to just sort of reach out and touch and sort of sense them uh, from sort of different tactile experiences. Now, the Iris' piece is sitting on a piece by Alberta Tranberg. And Alberta uh, arrived here at Cranbrook the same month that I did in August of 2016. She graduated from the metal smithing department in 2018. She is from Copenhagen, and she is a metal fabricator and welder. Um, Alberta's parents were a teacher and an architect, and Alberta uh, writes that she was sort of grew up in this Miesian world of grids and of squares. And so her work, which is almost always in sheet steel like this piece, um, she's interested in how can you make a vessel or, or something that is holding and caring and comforting out of sheet steel and within the grid. And so she's always working within this sort of materiality of steel and, and these sort of perfections of the grid. Now, here is the thermostat. And then above that is a piece by Amy Wong, who is a Harvard undergraduate who was a pre-med student. And then she came to Cranbrook and studied metal smithing for two years. She went back to med or medical school, uh, and now she is in her brain surgery residency. Um, she was not an artist before she came to Cranbrook, uh, but we see a number of her pieces here on the wall in the house. At the center is Billie Holiday. This is a print by Marlene Dumas, who is a South African artist working in the Netherlands. And uh, in Dumas' uh, artist statement, she talks about her portraits not so much being people, but being emotions. And so she's very interested in her paintings and in her prints in evoking these sort of powerful emotions. Up above, another work by Iris, I believe. And then surrounding it, different pieces from Iris's collections, including a very recent piece by a painting student. And then more of the um, Makande body mask, the Lapico pieces, the pregnancy mask. And then, of course, the uh, Charles Eames of America, Charles Eames, with his wife, Ray Kaiser Eames, and the potato chip chair, which grew out of Eames's work here at Cranbrook with Aero Saarinen. Next, we turn to the couch, which is a custom uh, Iris Eichenberg and Alberta Tranberg collaboration. Um, so the couch, the cushion was part of a day bed that Iris had in her last Cranbrook home. She moved over here in 2017 from the former Cranbrook Foundation offices that are now an apartment. And so when she moved here, she suddenly had this fireplace to contend with. And all of these little houses have fireplaces. And so she had that sort of natural impulse of wanting to be sheltered to the fireplace. And so uh, Alberta and Iris constructed this beautiful sheet steel um, couch. And then the flat minimalist cushion is complemented by these Argentinian uh, guaucho sheep saddle, sheepskin saddle covers. So Argentinian cowboys use these on the top layer of their saddle. And then as a coffee table, 
It rests on the couch or on the floor is an African tray that Iris bought about 30 years ago at a fish market. Uh, and when she bought it, it was sort of covered in this beautiful patina of grease. And uh, the women at the market stalls sit with these in front of them covered with their wares. And Iris purchased the, the vendor a new wooden tray and took the old wooden, wooden tray because she wanted that sort of uh, patina and that evidence of use. And now Iris has used it for 30 years. And in 30 years of use and cleaning, she sort of removed the layers of its uh, market days. And it's becoming yet another new thing. And then I hope Iris doesn't mind that I share this uh, with you. But uh, even sort of best laid plans, measure twice, cut once, uh, the couch actually does, did not quite fit in the room. And so there is this uh, reveal here of the sheet steel. I, I love it as the sort of evidence of um, construction. Yesterday, we were looking at Paul Evans and his work and Evans' idea that if you can't tell something was handmade and it was handmade, you've done something wrong. Now, the uh, Prouvé lamp here is by a metalsmithing student inspired by the French industrial designer Prouvé with a new shade on it. And then there is this great Marcel Vanders uh, Dutch uh, rope chair, not a chair. And this is one of the icons of late 20th century design, retailed at the um, art collaborative and store the Droch, or it's spelled Droog. Um, and so this is uh, Marcel Vanders and is friends with um, plastic or epoxy. Now we'll turn and we see her garden in the back where she has the raised planter beds and uh, the bamboo. And then if you can see the sort of candlestick out in the yard, that is another collaboration between Iris and Alberta. And there is a addition here on the dining room table as well, which is the table was constructed again by Iris. We see here a platter, uh, which was purchased at the Paul Katuya Gallery and is um, made by a collective in Iowa, I believe. James Strosby of the Peace Project Projects. And then there is Iris's sort of workspace here with her Eames shell chair and then this wonderful textile that Iris was telling me is used in uh, Germany, where, where she is from, uh, by coal miners. And so coal miners buy this weave structure, cut it down to the length that they need, and then they pack their lunch in it. And then when they're ready to eat lunch, they're sort of covered in the, the coal dust and the coal. And so they unfold the entire blanket and it covers up their filthy clothing and then they can eat off of it. We can see what she's working on. She's knitting currently, little hearts. Another piece by Iris here, which is a woven tapestry that she spent a couple of years weaving and it was very bright colors. And then she photographed the tapestry and made this sort of black and white version of the original piece. And then there are these kind of amazing steel wall shelves here in the dining area, um, which is another Iris and Alberta Tranberg collaboration. And along the sort of cabinet of curiosities, we have globes, we have Japanese dolls from the 1940s, um, more pieces from Africa, including these African headrests here on the edge. And then a series of ceramics by the Minnesota ceramicist uh, Warren McKenzie. Um, he just died in 2018, but Warren McKenzie was uh, taught at the University of Minnesota for decades, since 1953. And he works in earthenware in a style that he called um, the Minji Soda style, uh, because he's inspired by the Japanese Minji ceramics, which were a sort of folk craft from the 1920s. And so he called his own style Minji Sota. Elsewhere on this shelf, we see a little uh, beautiful vase by Wade Tillier, who is a recent graduate of Cranbrook's 
ceramics department and an employee over at the art museum. We see some hearts that Iris has knitted back in the 90s and she's begun knitting them again. Ceramics by John McGill. And then down here, a collection of boxes, but also this really cool metal rattle sort of piece. And this is by a Korean student from the metal smithing department, uh, Unji Choi, who is back in South Korea now. She works out of Seoul. And she studied fine metal work, traditional metal craft at Kukumin University in South Korea. And she's interested in creating pieces that sort of blend craft and ritual and blend everyday functional objects uh, with tools and sort of sacred objects. And so you see the rattle with all the bells here. And then down below are some shaker boxes and more boxes that Iris has collected over the years. And then this little piece that I thought was made out of, you know, leather somehow stiffened, uh, but it's in fact sheet steel uh, with a green enamel. And this is another piece by Alberta. And then illuminating this whole shelf is Michael McCoy's Horizon Lamp, which Michael and Catherine McCoy were head of the design department at Cranbrook from the 70s to the 90s. Um, and this is a lamp from 2012, uh, manufactured by Human Scale. It was one of the first LED strip lamps. The Horizon Lamp. If anyone has any questions, do you type them in. And if you're just joining us, I'm Kevin Adkison with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today we are touring um, the home of Cranbrook Academy of Art, head of metalsmithing, artist in residence, Iris Eichenberg, which is in one of Aliel Saarinen's faculty houses on Academy Way. Now attached to the house, all of the houses have these covered porches, which are really quite exquisite. Um, and these wooden porches look out over private garden areas, which are the responsibility of the residents to maintain. And so I saw Iris all summer lugging soil back here for, in her truck to make her raised planting bed. And then there are also these great uh, German plastic lamps that are from the farm where Iris uh, grew up in Germany. And as we reconnect here together, um, back inside. The last thing I want to show us in the living room, well, two last things. Uh, here on the ceiling, you can just see that line going across. This is actually a built-in curtain rod, uh, which would have divided the dining room from the living room. And so it runs the entire width of the room. And originally, Aliel Saarinen designed the interiors of these spaces. None of the Saarinen furniture survives. What he selected are what he designed for the house. Um, but I do think it's sort of amazing, the idea of dividing this room with a curtain built in all the way across. And then down here on the floor, uh, we see this covered up button here. This is actually the maid's button. So that as the artist in residence was at dinner, they could ring the with their foot. Now, the last piece that I'll point out here in the dining room is this little hand. And this is part of a project that Iris started in May with uh, Yamina Rios, an uh, Argentine artist. And this hand project, you can learn more about it by going to handmetalproject.com. Uh, but it was started in response to the global coronavirus uh, pandemic. And so it is in the spirit of the uh, South American tradition of having ex voto, or sort of handmade objects of devotion that add honor gratitude. And so metalsmiths around the world in some 66 countries um, and some 3000 jewelry artists and metalsmiths are making these little hands right now. And then they are going to uh, give them to healthcare workers. And so on November 8th, 
tens of thousands of these little hand medals uh, will be distributed to frontline health workers on every continent all around the world. And so it combines the sort of spirit of ex votos of those handmade objects of devotions with the idea of giving a sort of tribute or a medal to these frontline workers. And Iris uh, told a reporter that she wants to uh, make do with what you have to say thank you. And so all of the hands are made of different materials. All the ribbons are different materials. All of it is bespoke, but it's not so much about who's making these, but about sort of honoring those who are helping in this time of global crisis um, through the arts and through the handmade. And it, it has this really interesting balance of the idea of the, with the coronavirus, the hand has sort of turned into a weapon and we have to wash our hands and we have to put we have to be careful with our hands. And yet at the same time, the hand is this uh, great object of nurturing and healing. And so on November 8th, in order to give that uh, troubling date a uh, something new and something celebratory, uh, now it will be a date where the hand metal project commemorates all of the sacrifices to the healthcare workers. So if you want to learn more, go to handmetalsproject.com. Now, the last piece in this room, I think I've said that three times, is another work by Iris, and it is in the wall here, this flesh-colored piece. Now, originally, this would have been a door into the maid's room, and so the maid would have lived in the house. It's now a guest room. My dad has stayed there, and so it's just one bedroom and a bathroom that would have been connected to the pantry, and then the kitchen. Now this space has changed quite a bit, and so it's now just one room instead of two. Originally there would have been a clock there uh, along the um, heating return. The faculty had to provide their own oven, and then there was a little sort of kitchen here that was originally a Formica countertop with aluminum banding, which is remarkably what Iris has gone back to. So this is now an Ikea kitchen with custom orange uh, for mica top that Iris installed. And it's actually quite close to the original drawings that are in archives, uh, which show the for mica top with aluminum banding. Now, the stools here are from Cape Town. The rug is a Moroccan basharut. And then there is this great butcher block that is in fact a block from Amsterdam. So one of the pieces that Iris brought with her. And then she also designed the rack for her pots and pans and implements, which has this sort of shaker-like quality of the pegs and then the knife block there, and all of these wonderful lamps. Then there is also the uh, French railway auto clock telling the time and showing me how slow I am on these tours. And then we're passing by a piece that Iris picked up in Accra, Ghana, uh, from a hair salon next to a, um, uh, another piece that she picked up in Jerusalem, a camel blanket. Now there is a, here we see the whole kitchen. There is a basement to the house that has a laundry room. And then originally the telephone block was right there. We will go upstairs and I'll step back a little bit just to show you how the stairs are designed, uh, which is a motif that Cranbrook has all over campus. Aliel Sarnan's own stairs are like this. My stairway is like this. Uh, the Millis House stairs are like this. Uh, and so we see the sort of continuity of design across the campus. Now, this is a wood frame building, so it's a little bit different than the other side of the street, which are concrete and brick buildings. As we come upstairs, we'll quickly go through a number of smaller bedrooms. Here we see an African mask over the bed, and then um, another wonderful Tulu rug from Turkey. This great little table lamp here is uh, French by Ronan and Irwin uh, uh, designers that called the Piani lamp from 2011. And they wrote that they wanted to make a table lamp that was like a mini stage for whatever you put on it. There's also a great glass piece in here by Richard Meitner, 
who is a faculty at the Reichfeld Academy, where Iris used to taught, Philadelphia-born artist. His aunt was Lisa Meissner, who, with Otto Hahn, invented nuclear fission back in the 1930s. Next, uh, we see a portrait of myself that I don't know how Iris got this, uh, but here I am. That is. We also see the classic Cranbrook uh, window effect of having vines across your windows. And then this room shares a Jack and Jill bathroom with the next window. Here in the bathroom is a print by Randy Bolton, who was the uh, head of the Cranbrook Academy of Art Print Media Department from 2002 to 2016. And then the great Cranbrook scale tub, which I did not test this one out, but at least in my own house, I can lay fully down in the bathtub, which is pretty nice. And then we'll slip into the next bedroom where we see the ghost of Heather McGill. Uh, Heather McGill, the former head of sculpture who lived in this house for decades. And so here's a really beautiful piece by Heather, uh, which is made of laser cut plexiglass and, uh, or not plexi, it is plexi. I should not talk about an artist that I do not know their work. It is very beautiful and very reflective. And then we see the desk here, which has the sort of wonderful view out towards the dormitories of Cranbrook School for Boys. The glass here is by M uh, Mika Hott, who is another glass instructor at the Rietveld Academy. And then if we look out at the view, we get this wonderful fall day with the leaves changing. And then one thing that Iris told me she really loved about the house is the proportion of the rooms and the quality of light, which is, I think, one of Aelial Sarnen's sort of signature um, skills is the ability to create, um, create, rooms that, that as the day progresses, the light completely transforms your sense of the place. And so even here where there are not leaded glass windows, like in the earliest Cranbrook buildings, these are just aluminum frame windows, which is a little bit not as exciting, uh, but it's still, it's that control of the light in the space. Now in the hallway here, we see another painting uh, by Nancy Michnik, the Cass Corridor Detroit artist. And then into the third bedroom, which, oh, we have seen the other cat now, Harry, the red-headed cat. Uh, and in this room, which I'll turn the light on, um, we see a lamp by Anders Ruald, who was the Danish-born head of Cranbrook Ceramics from 2008 to 2017. And so one of his wonderfully quirky little lamps. And then one of my favorite pieces, a deer-like fantasy um, by Jens Pfeiffer, who is a German-born artist working in the Netherlands, who is interested in combining sort of views of the natural world with culture and where they blend together. And so what is our idea of nature versus actual nature? And the fact that even when we're sort of digital creatures in interior spaces, we're always part of nature. And so his work kind of examines this blend of fantasy of actual uh, nature and perceptions. Also in this room, we see the very cool paint uh, design that Iris has done in these spaces to help expand the width of these very long, narrow rooms. And then in the corner, we see a leg splint which was designed by Charles and Ray Eames during World War II uh, when wartime restrictions meant they could not be working on chairs, but he, they still wanted to be experimenting with uh, compound curved molded plywood. And so they made these leg splints for the U.S. Army and tens of thousands of these were deployed to the front line for servicemen. And then the last room on our tour will turn all the way around into the master bedroom. 
which we see here, this very cozy spot, more of these beautiful rugs and textiles. And in this space, there's a couple of artworks that I'll point out. Um, the first is a French artist who left France as a very young boy, uh, Nic uh, Nicolas Rubio. He worked in Buenos Aires for the rest of his career, but his topic of what he painted was always his childhood in France. And so this is a piece from 1965, and there are these sort of wonderful knights and bishops marching across uh, his memories of his childhood French village. And then another one by Nicolas Rubio, again from 1965, showing the guitarist down here. And then this devil, which personally, I don't know if I would want to wake up to every day, but I'm not an artist. And then in this corner of the room, past the bird seed and the bird feeder, we see a piece, piece by Tapani Koko, who is a Finnish artist. And then there is this wonderful molecule that's hanging above Iris's head. And one thing that Iris pointed out in this room is that from the bed, uh, she can see not one, not two, but ten doors, <laughs> which is this very Sarnen way of designing. Um, of course, only a couple of them intersect, but you can see the closets from the other bedroom, the door into the bedroom, the door into the room, the closet, the bathroom, and then the two doors here. I also, in my Sarnen designed apartment, have a room of seven doors, and that's seven leading into one room. Very hard to put anything on the wall in a seven-doored room. And then I asked her if I could show this space, which is how we know an artist lives here is the closet of black clothing. <laughs> so if you ever see Iris, you know she is the one in all black. Now I want to thank Iris so much for allowing us to come into her private space um, and, and for, for letting me show off her collection. I hope I didn't uh, butcher too many artist names uh, uh, on our little tour here. It was a pleasure learning about her house last night with her and then spending some of today researching these artists and learning more about them to share with you. I know for me, uh, the first time I saw one of these places was when Heather McGill moved out, moved out and they were refinishing the wood floors. And so I can only imagine those of you who have been driving up and down Academy Way for decades, just wanting to know what these buildings look like. And it's uh, really interesting to me that from the outside, first of all, I'm not sure a lot of people even noticing you, uh, notice these buildings because they're so sort of modest, especially relative to Sarnen's buildings of the 1920s uh, and the art museum at the end of the street. And so uh, residents three through eight, they really get kind of compressed and you don't even notice them behind the ivy and the trees. But what's wonderful for the people who are able to live here, for the artists and residents and their family, is that these houses are huge. They're beautifully proportioned. They have wonderful light. And they're so private because Sarnen puts the stairway right across the front of the street. And then he puts all of the living space, the bedrooms and the living room, facing these private courtyards. So it's a pretty ingenious way of designing a campus residence in order to create uh, both a street grid for the everyday viewer, but then this sort of private realm for the people who live here. I don't know if anyone has any last questions that they uh, want to type in and send me while we finish up with just another view of the beautiful home of Iris Eichenberg, the head of Cranbrook's Department of Metalsmithing. Of course, if you want to learn more about Iris's work, you can visit her website or find her on Instagram. And if you want to learn more about the Academy of Art and its metalsmithing department, you can visit its new and beautiful website and see some of their work. Hopefully sometime soon in the future, we'll be able to gather again uh, in person. And each year I have the pleasure of working with Iris and her students in uh, creating a exhibition within Cranbrook House uh, of work by the student artist. 
And of course it has a great sort of symmetry because George Booth himself was a metalsmith. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'll be back next Wednesday for another Live at Five from who knows where I'll be. Uh, and then on Sunday, we are collaborating with the Dokomomo organization, documenting the modern movement, celebrating the 70s turning 50. And so on Sunday, I'll be giving a brief lecture on the history of 70s architecture in Michigan, as well as a tour of the Frank Lloyd Wright Design Smith House, uh, featuring its stories and objects from the 70s. It'll be broadcast as well from Bolero, the bowling alley in Royal Oak. And then on October 27th, I'll be delivering the next Uncovering Cranbrook lecture series, uh, which will focus on Aero Saarinen and his designs for Yale University and his time as a student at the greatest school in America. Um, thanks so much for joining me for this tour, um, and I will see you all next week. I hope everyone is getting out and enjoying Michigan or wherever you are here at this moment of peak leaf. And I'll leave you with this exterior view of residence number three, the home of Iris Eichenberg. Thanks everyone.